The Harlem Renaissance was an intellectual and cultural revival of African American music, dance, art, fashion, literature, theater, politics and scholarship centered in Harlem, Manhattan, New York City, spanning the 1920s and 1930s. At the time, it was known as the New Negro Movement, named after the New Negro, a 1925 anthology edited by Alain Locke. The movement also included the new African-American cultural expressions across the urban areas in the Northeast and Midwest United States affected by a renewed militancy in the general struggle for civil rights, combined with the great migration of African-American workers fleeing the racist conditions of the Jim Crow Deep South, as Harlem was the final destination of the largest number of those who migrated north. Though it was centered in the Harlem neighborhood, Many Francophone black writers from African and Caribbean colonies who lived in Paris were also influenced by the movement, which spanned from about 1918 until the mid-minus 1930s. Many of its ideas lived on much longer. The zenith of this, flowering of Negro literature, as James Weldon Johnson preferred to call the Harlem Renaissance, took place between 1924, when opportunity, a journal of Negro life hosted a party for black writers where many white publishers were in attendance, and 1929, the year of the stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. The Harlem Renaissance is considered to have been a rebirth of the African American arts. Until the end of the Civil War, the majority of African Americans had been enslaved and lived in the South. During the Reconstruction era, the emancipated African Americans began to strive for civic participation, political equality, and economic and cultural self-determination. Soon after the end of the Civil War, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 gave rise to speeches by African American congressmen addressing this bill. Eight by 1875, 16 African Americans had been elected and served in Congress and gave numerous speeches with their newfound civil empowerment. The Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 was followed by the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1875, part of Reconstruction legislation by Republicans. During the mid to late 1870s, racist whites organized and the Democratic Party launched a murderous campaign of racist terrorism to regain political power throughout the South. From 1890 to 1908, they proceeded to pass legislation that disenfranchised most African Americans and many poor whites, trapping them without representation. They established white supremacist regimes of Jim Crow segregation in the South and one-party bloc voting behind Southern Democrats. Democratic Party politicians many having been former slave owners and political and military leaders of the Confederacy conspired to deny African Americans their exercise of civil and political rights by terrorizing black communities with lynch mobs and other forms of vigilante violence 10, as well as by instituting a convict labor system that forced many thousands of African Americans back into unpaid labor in mines, plantations and on public works projects such as roads and levees. Convict laborers were typically subject to brutal forms of corporal punishment, overwork and disease from unsanitary conditions. Death rates were extraordinarily high. While a small number of African Americans were able to acquire land shortly after the Civil War, most were exploited as sharecroppers. Whether sharecropping or on their own acreage, most of the black population was closely financially dependent on agriculture. This added another impetus for the migration, the arrival of the boll weevil. The beetle eventually came to waste 8% of the country's cotton yield annually and thus disproportionately impacted this part of America's citizenry. As life in the South became increasingly difficult, African Americans began to migrate north in great numbers. Most of the future leading lights of what was to become known as the Harlem Renaissance, Movement arose from a generation that had memories of the gains and losses of Reconstruction after the Civil War. Sometimes their parents, grandparents or they themselves had been slaves. Their ancestors had sometimes benefited by paternal investment in cultural capital, including better than average education. Many in the Harlem Renaissance were part of the early 20th century Great Migration out of the South into the African American neighborhoods of the Northeast and Midwest. African Americans sought a better standard of living and relief from the institutionalized racism in the South.
Others were people of African descent from racially stratified communities in the Caribbean who came to the United States hoping for a better life. Uniting most of them was their convergence in Harlem. During the early portion of the 20th century, Harlem was the destination for migrants from around the country, attracting both people from the South seeking work and an educated class who Matathire a center of culture, as well as a growing, Negro, middle class. These people were looking for a fresh start in life and this was a good place to go. The district had originally been developed in the 19th century as an exclusive suburb for the white middle and upper middle classes, its affluent beginnings led to the development of stately houses, grand avenues, and world-class amenities such as the Polo Grounds and the Harlem Opera House. During the enormous influx of European immigrants in the late 19th century, the once-exclusive district was abandoned by the white middle class, who moved farther north. Harlem became an African-American neighborhood in the early 1900s. In 1910, a large block along 135th Street and 5th Avenue was bought by various African-American realtors and a church group. 14th Citation needed many more African-Americans arrived during the First World War. Due to the war, the migration of laborers from Europe virtually ceased, while the war effort resulted in a massive demand for unskilled industrial labor. The Great Migration brought hundreds of thousands of African Americans to cities such as Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit and New York. Despite the increasing popularity of Negro culture, virulent white racism, often by more recent ethnic immigrants, continued to affect African American communities, even in the North. 15. After the end of World War I, many African American soldiers, who fought in segregated units such as the Harlem Hellfighters, came home to a nation whose citizens often did not respect their accomplishments. Race riots and other civil uprisings occurred throughout the United States during the Red Summer of 1919, reflecting economic competition over jobs and housing in many cities, as well as tensions over social territories. Mainstream Recognition of Harlem Culture The first stage of the Harlem Renaissance started in the late 1910s. In 1917, the premiere of Granny Maumee, the writer of Dreams, Simon the Cyrenian, plays for a Negro theater took place. These plays, written by white playwright Ridgely Torrance, featured African-American actors conveying complex human emotions and yearnings. They rejected the stereotypes of the blackface and minstrel show traditions. In 1917, James Weldon Johnson called the premieres of these plays, the most important single event in the entire history of the Negro in the American theater. Another landmark came in 1919, when the communist poet Claude McKay published his militant sonnet, If We Must Die, which introduced a dramatically political dimension to the themes of African cultural inheritance and modern urban experience featured in his 1917 poems, Invocation, and Harlem Dancer. Published under the pseudonym Eli Edwards, these were his first appearance in print in the United States after immigrating from Jamaica. Although, If We Must Die, never alluded to race, African-American readers heard its note of defiance in the face of racism and the nationwide race riots and lynchings then taking place. By the end of the First World War, the fiction of James Weldon Johnson and the poetry of Claude McKay were describing the reality of contemporary African-American life in America. The Harlem Renaissance grew out of the changes that had taken place in the African-American community since the abolition of slavery, as the expansion of communities in the North. These accelerated as a consequence of World War I and the great social and cultural changes in early 20th century United States. Industrialization was attracting people to cities from rural areas and gave rise to a new mass culture. Contributing factors leading to the Harlem Renaissance were the great migration of African Americans to northern cities, which concentrated ambitious people in places where they could encourage each other, and the First World War, which had created new industrial work opportunities for tens of thousands of people. Factors leading to the decline of this era include the Great Depression. Christianity played a major role in the Harlem Renaissance. Many of the writers and social critics discuss the role of Christianity in African American lives. For example, a famous poem by Langston Hughes, 
Madam and the Minister, reflects the temperature and mood towards religion in the Harlem Renaissance. The cover story for the Crisis magazine's publication in May 1936 explains how important Christianity was regarding the proposed union of the three largest Methodist churches of 1936. This article shows the controversial question of unification for these churches. The article, The Catholic Church and the Negro Priest, also published in The Crisis, January 1920, demonstrates the obstacles that African-American priests faced in the Catholic Church. The article confronts what it saw as policies based on race that excluded African Americans from higher positions in the church. Various forms of religious worship existed during this time of African American intellectual reawakening. Although there were racist attitudes within the current Abrahamic religious arenas, many African Americans continued to push towards the practice of a more inclusive doctrine. For example, George Joseph McWilliam presents various experiences of rejection on the basis of his color and race during his pursuit towards priesthood, yet he shares his frustration in attempts to incite action on the part of the Crisis magazine community. 28. There were other forms of spiritualism practiced among African Americans during the Harlem Renaissance. Some of these religions and philosophies were inherited from African ancestry. For example, the religion of Islam was present in Africa as early as the 8th century through the Trans-Saharan trade. Islam came to Harlem likely through the migration of members of the Moorish Science Temple of America, which was established in 1913 in New Jersey. Citation needed various forms of Judaism were practiced, including Orthodox, Conservative and Reform Judaism, but it was Black Hebrew Israelites that founded their religious belief system during the early 20th century in the Harlem Renaissance. Citation needed traditional forms of religion acquired from various parts of Africa were inherited and practiced during this era. Some common examples were Voodoo and Santeria. Criticism Religious critique during this era was found in music, literature, art, theater and poetry. The Harlem Renaissance encouraged analytic dialogue that included the open critique and the adjustment of current religious ideas. One of the major contributors to the discussion of African-American Renaissance culture was Aaron Douglas, who, with his artwork, also reflected the revisions African-Americans were making to the Christian dogma. Douglas uses biblical imagery as inspiration to various pieces of artwork, but with the rebellious twist of an African influence. 29. County Cullen's poem, Heritage, expresses the inner struggle of an African-American between his past African heritage and the new Christian culture. 30. A more severe criticism of the Christian religion can be found in Langston Hughes's poem, Merry Christmas, where he exposes the irony of religion as a symbol for good and yet a force for oppression and injustice. 31. A new way of playing the piano called the Harlem Stride style was created during the Harlem Renaissance helping to blur the lines between the poor African Americans and socially elite African Americans. The traditional jazz band was composed primarily of brass instruments and was considered a symbol of the South, but the piano was considered an instrument of the wealthy. With this instrumental modification to the existing genre, the wealthy African Americans now had more access to jazz music. Its popularity soon spread throughout the country and was consequently at an all-time high. Innovation and liveliness were important characteristics of performers in the beginnings of jazz. Jazz performers and composers at the time such as U.B. Blake, Noble Sissel, Jelly Roll Morton, Lucky Roberts, James P. Johnson, Willie, The Lion, Smith, Andy Rosef, Fats Waller, Ethel Waters, Adelaide Hall, 32 Florence Mills and bandleaders Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong and Fletcher Henderson were extremely talented, skillful, competitive and inspirational. They are still considered as having laid great parts of the foundations for future musicians of their genre. 33, 34, 35 Duke Ellington gained popularity during the Harlem Renaissance. According to Charles Garrett, the resulting portrait of Ellington reveals him to be not only the gifted composer, bandleader, and musician we have come to know, but also an earthly person with basic desires, weaknesses, and eccentricities. 7. Ellington did not let his popularity get to him. He remained calm and focused on his music.
During this period, the musical style of blacks was becoming more and more attractive to whites. White novelists, dramatists and composers started to exploit the musical tendencies and themes of African Americans in their works. Composers including William Grant Still, William L. Dawson and Florence Price used poems written by African American poets in their songs, and would implement the rhythms, harmonies and melodies of African American music, such as blues, spirituals and jazz, into their concert pieces. African Americans began to merge with whites into the classical world of musical composition. The first African American male to gain wide recognition as a concert artist in both his region and internationally was Roland Hayes. He trained with Arthur Calhoun in Chattanooga, and at Fisk University in Nashville. Later, he studied with Arthur Hubbard in Boston and with George Henschel and Amanda Ira Aldridge in London, England. Hayes began singing in public as a student, and he toured with the Fisk Jubilee Singers in 1911. 36. According to James Vernon Hatch and Leo Hamalian, All Black Review, Run, Little Chillin', is considered one of the most successful musical dramas of the Harlem Renaissance. 37. Fashion. During the Harlem Renaissance, the African-American clothing scene took a dramatic turn from the prim and proper many young women preferred, from short skirts and silk stockings to drop-waisted dresses and cloche hats. Thirty-eight women wore loose-fitted garments and accessorized with long-strand pearl bead necklaces, feather boas and cigarette holders. The fashion of the Harlem Renaissance was used to convey elegance and flamboyancy and needed to be created with the vibrant dance style of the 1920s in mind. 39 popular by the 1930s was a trendy, egret trimmed beret. Men were loose suits that led to the later style known as the zoot, which consisted of wide-legged, high-waisted, peg-top trousers, and a long coat with padded shoulders and wide lapels. Men also wore wide-brimmed hats, colored socks, 40 white gloves and velvet-collared Chesterfield coats. During this period, African Americans expressed respect for their heritage through a fad for leopard skin coats, indicating the power of the African animal. The extraordinarily successful black dancer Josephine Baker, though performing in Paris during the height of the Renaissance, was a major fashion trendsetter for black and white women alike. Her gowns from the couturier Jean Pateau were much copied, especially her stage costumes, which Vogue magazine called, startling. Josephine Baker is also credited for highlighting the Art Deco fashion era after she performed the Don Sauvage. During this Paris performance, she adorned a skirt made of string and artificial bananas. Ethel Moses was another popular black performer. Moses starred in silent films in the 1920s and 1930s and was recognizable by her signature bob hairstyle. Photography James Van Der Zee's photography played an important role in shaping and documenting the cultural and social life of Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance. His photographs were instrumental in shaping the image and identity of the African American community during the Harlem Renaissance. His work documented the achievements of cultural figures and helped to challenge stereotypes and racist attitudes, 41 which in turn promoted pride and dignity among African Americans in Harlem and beyond. Van Der Zee's studio was not just a place for taking photographs, it was also a social and cultural hub for Harlem residents. Forty-two people would come to his studio not only to have their portraits taken, but also to socialize and to participate in the community events that he hosted. Van Der Zee's studio played an important role in the cultural life of Harlem during the early 20th century, and helped to foster a sense of community and pride among its residents. Some notable persons photographed are Marcus Garvey, the leader of the Universal Negro Improvement Association UNIA, a black nationalist organization that promoted Pan-Africanism and economic independence for African Americans. Other notable black persons he photographed are County Cullen, a poet and writer who was associated with the Harlem Renaissance, Josephine Baker, a dancer and entertainer who became famous in France and was known for her provocative performances, W.E.B. Dubois, a sociologist, historian and civil rights activist who was a leading figure in the African-American community in the early 20th century, 
Langston Hughes, a poet, novelist and playwright who was one of the most important writers of the Harlem Renaissance, and Madam C.J. Walker, an entrepreneur and philanthropist who was one of the first African-American women to become a self-made millionaire, as well as her daughter, Dorothy Waring, an artist and author of 12 novels. Van Der Zee's work gained renewed attention in the 1960s and 1970s, when interest in the Harlem Renaissance was revived. Van Der Zee's photographs have been featured in numerous exhibitions over the years. One notable exhibition was, Harlem on My Mind, Cultural Capital of Black America, 1900-1968, 43, which was organized by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1969. The exhibit included over 300 photographs, many of which were by Van Der Zee, and was one of the first major exhibitions to focus on the cultural achievements of African Americans in Harlem. Van Der Zee's work was the eyes of Harlem. His photographs are recognized as important documents of African American life and culture during the early 20th century. They serve as a visual record of the achievements of the Harlem Renaissance. 44. His portraits of writers, musicians, artists and other cultural figures helped to promote their work and bring attention to the vibrant creative scene known as Harlem. Called, primitive, cultures, as many whites viewed black American culture at that time, and wanted to see such, primitivism, in the work coming out of the Harlem Renaissance. As with most fads, some people may have been exploited in the rush for publicity. Interest in African American lives also generated experimental but lasting collaborative work, such as the all-black productions of George Gershwin's opera Porgy and Bess, and Virgil Thompson and Gertrude Stein's Four Saints in Three Acts. In both productions the choral conductor Eva Jesse was part of the creative team. Her choir was featured in Four Saints. 45. The music world also found white band leaders defying racist attitudes to include the best and the brightest African-American stars of music and song in their productions. The African-Americans used art to prove their humanity and demand for equality. The Harlem Renaissance led to more opportunities for blacks to be published by mainstream houses. Many authors began to publish novels, magazines and newspapers during this time. The new fiction attracted a great amount of attention from the nation at large. Among authors who became nationally known were Jean Toomer, Jesse Fawcett, Claude McKay, Zora Neale Hurston, James Weldon Johnson, Alain Locke, Omar Al-Amiri, Eric D. Walrond and Langston Hughes. Richard Bruce Nugent 1906-1987, who wrote, Smoke, Lilies, and Jade, made an important contribution, especially in relation to experimental form and LGBT themes in the period. 46. The Harlem Renaissance helped lay the foundation for the post-World War II protest movement of the civil rights movement. Moreover, many black artists who rose to creative maturity afterward were inspired by this literary movement. The Renaissance was more than a literary or artistic movement, as it possessed a certain sociological development, particularly through a new racial consciousness, through ethnic pride, as seen in the Back to Africa movement led by Jamaican Marcus Garvey. At the same time, a different expression of ethnic pride, promoted by W. E. B. Dubois, introduced the notion of the Talented Tenth. Dubois wrote of the Talented Tenth. The Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. The problem of education, then, among Negroes must first of all deal with the talented tenth, it is the problem of developing the best of this race that they may guide the mass away from the contamination and death of the worst. These, talented tenth, were considered the finest examples of the worth of black Americans as a response to the rampant racism of the period. No particular leadership was assigned to the talented tenth, but they were to be emulated. In both literature and popular discussion, complex ideas such as Dubois' concept of Tunis, dualism, were introduced, see The Souls of Black Folk, 1903. Dubois explored a divided awareness of one's identity that was a unique critique of the social ramifications of racial consciousness. This exploration was later revived during the Black Pride movement of the early 1970s. A New Black Identity
The Harlem Renaissance was successful in that it brought the black experience clearly within the corpus of American cultural history. Not only through an explosion of culture, but on a sociological level, the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance redefined how America, and the world, viewed African Americans. The migration of Southern blacks to the North changed the image of the African American from rural, undereducated peasants to one of urban, cosmopolitan sophistication. This new identity led to a greater social consciousness, and African Americans became players on the world stage, expanding intellectual and social contacts internationally. The progress, both symbolic and real, during this period became a point of reference from which the African American community gained a spirit of self-determination that provided a growing sense of both black urbanity and black militancy, as well as a foundation for the community to build upon for the civil rights struggles in the 1950s and 1960s. The urban setting of rapidly developing Harlem provided a venue for African Americans of all backgrounds to appreciate the variety of black life and culture. Through this expression, the Harlem Renaissance encouraged the new appreciation of folk roots and culture. For instance, folk materials and spirituals provided a rich source for the artistic and intellectual imagination, which freed blacks from the establishment of past condition. Through sharing in these cultural experiences, a consciousness sprung forth in the form of a united racial identity. However, there was some pressure within certain groups of the Harlem Renaissance to adopt sentiments of conservative white America in order to be taken seriously by the mainstream. The result being that queer culture, while far more accepted in Harlem than most places in the country at the time, was most fully lived out in the smoky dark lights of bars, nightclubs and cabarets in the city. It was within these venues that the blues music scene boomed, and, since it had not yet gained recognition within popular culture, queer artists used it as a way to express themselves honestly. Even though there were factions within the Renaissance that were accepting of queer culture lifestyles, one could still be arrested for engaging in homosexual acts. Many people, including author Alice Dunbar Nelson and, the mother of blues, Gertrude, Ma, Rainey, 50 had husbands but were romantically linked to other women as well. Harlem Renaissance Influence from Women in the LGBTQ Community It is critical that the roles of lesbian and transgender women in history receive more close and critical inquiry. Recognition of the intersectionality of race, gender and sexuality, and its effects on larger societal perceptions of identity, establishes the greater and fuller historical context of this period. Many leading literary, musical and theatrical figures of the Harlem Renaissance are believed to have, at some point, engaged in lesbian, gay or bisexual relations, but that did not mean there was a widespread tolerance. Although 1920s and 1930s queer blackness is often rendered invisible, the Harlem Renaissance also presented a new space for queer African American artists to showcase their work without fear of social backlash. Many historical Harlem Renaissance artists, such as Claude McKay, Langston Hughesm and Ethel Waters, engaged in private queer relations, although it was not public knowledge. Many integrated communities, and homosexual and heterosexual people, gathered in the same recreational spaces. Places such as the Cotton Club and Rockland Palace routinely held drag shows in addition to straight performances of art. Lesbian or bisexual performers, such as blues singers Gladys Bentley and Bessie Smith, were a part of the Harlem music scene. This style of music helped to renew black interest in African Americans' culture, while also introducing it for the first time to others. Women during this time were seen as too blinkered by their middle-class location to identify the, real, issues of African American life. There are, of course, exceptions to this categorization, legendary blues women like Bessie Smith and Florence Mills. Furthermore, there has been considerable effort on the part of black feminist critics in recent years to shift perceptions of women's cultural production during the Harlem years, and authors such as Nella Larson and Jessie Fawcett have gained a renewed degree of critical credence. But, overall, women were not seen as expressing genuine issues and were never taken seriously. Many famous black women of the early 20th century, such as Gertrude, Ma, Rainey, 
Bessie Smith and Bessie Jackson, turned being lesbian into socially acceptable instead of a taboo for not only the black community but for women all over. Moraney was known to dress in traditionally male clothing, and her blues lyrics often reflected her sexual proclivities for women, which was extremely radical at the time. Ma Rainey was also the first person to introduce blues music into vaudeville. Rainey's protege, Bessie Smith, was another artist who used the blues as a way to express herself with such lines as, When you see two women walking hand in hand, just look em over and try to understand, they'll go to those parties have the lights down low only those parties where women can go. Another prominent blues singer was Gladys Bentley, who was known to cross-dress. Bentley was the club owner of Clam House on 133rd Street in Harlem, which was a hub for queer patrons. The Hamilton Lodge in Harlem hosted an annual drag ball that attracted thousands to watch as a couple of hundred young men came to dance the night away in drag. Though there were safe havens within Harlem, there were prominent voices, such as that of Abyssinian Baptist Church's minister Adam Clayton Powell Sr., who actively campaigned against homosexuality. The Harlem Renaissance gave birth to the idea of the New Negro. The New Negro movement was anaphore to define what it meant to be African American by African Americans rather than let the degrading stereotypes and caricatures found in blackface minstrelsy practices to do so. There was also the Neo-New Negro movement, which not only challenged racial definitions and stereotypes, but also sought to challenge gender roles, normative sexuality and sexism in America in general. In this respect, the Harlem Renaissance was far ahead of the rest of America in terms of embracing feminism and queer culture. These ideals received some pushback as freedom of sexuality, particularly pertaining to women, which during the time in Harlem was known as women loving women, was seen as confirming the stereotype that black women were loose and lacked sexual discernment. The black bourgeoisie saw this as hampering the cause of black people in America and giving fuel to the fire of racist sentiments around the country. Yet, for all of the efforts by both sectors of white and conservative black America, queer culture and artists defined major portions of not only the Harlem Renaissance, but also define so much of our culture today. Author of, The Black Man's Burden, Henry Louis Gates Jr. wrote that the Harlem Renaissance was surely as gay as it was black. Criticism of the movement Many critics point out that the Harlem Renaissance could not escape its history and culture in its attempt to create a new one, or sufficiently separate from the foundational elements of white, European culture. Often Harlem intellectuals, while proclaiming a new racial consciousness, resorted to mimicry of their white counterparts by adopting their clothing, sophisticated manners and etiquette. This, mimicry, may also be called assimilation, as that is typically what minority members of any social construct must do in order to fit social norms created by that construct's majority. 58 This could be seen as a reason that the artistic and cultural products of the Harlem Renaissance did not overcome the presence of white American values, and did not reject these values. Citation needed in this regard, the creation of the New Negro as the Harlem intellect.